When the chilling news of 28-year-old neonatal nurse Lucy Lepre's arrest for murder in 2018 came, her loved ones and colleagues couldn't believe it. Described as beige and average, Lepre had lived a content childhood and had spent her youth dreaming of becoming a nurse, just like the ones who had helped her and her mother during her difficult birth. But somewhere along the line, something went wrong. How could someone so seemingly harmless cause so much destruction? In this documentary, we aim to shed light on such questions by examining the nightmarish case of Lucy Lepre, Britain's serial killer nurse. Early Life Lucy Letby was born on January 4th, 1990, in the city of Hereford, England. The only child of John and Suzanne Letby, a finance manager and an accounts clerk, respectively. She is described as living an idyllic childhood. She grew up on Arran Avenue, a small cul-de-sac off Hinton Road, and was a regular churchgoer. School friends of Letby's recalled that she was generous, gentle and considerate, with one describing her as having a joyful and peaceful aura that just made everyone around her happy and comfortable. She even adopted the nickname Mary Poppins, given to her by friends of her sweet and mothering nature. She always had supplies on hand to fix minor cuts and grazes, including plasters and antiseptic wipes. From a young age, she had dreamt of becoming a nurse, which was reportedly the result of her own birth being difficult for her mother. A friend told the BBC that Letby was very grateful for being alive to the nurses, who would have helped save her life. They added, everything that she did was geared towards that ultimate goal of becoming a nurse. Letby attended Aylstone School and Hereford Sixth Form College, where she was described as being shy and studious. Though not necessarily popular, she had a close group of friends who called themselves the Miss Match family. As she became a teenager and got closer to realizing her dream, she often spoke about children's health and development. Nobody around her was surprised by this. Letby herself would later tell the courts, I've always wanted to work with children, later adding that she chose her school subjects based on whether they would help support her career choice or not. Another friend of Letby's, Jade Thomas, noted that she was focused and career-driven from even such a young age, but added that she also one day wanted to settle down and have a husband and children of her own. After passing her A-levels, Letby began studying nursing at the University of Chester in September 2008. She studied general nursing for her first year before specialising in children's nursing for her second and third years. Noted as being the first person in her family to go to university, her parents were thrilled when she graduated, putting a notice in the local newspaper which read, We are so proud of you after all your hard work. Love, Mum and Dad. Letby's university peers similarly recalled her to her school friends, noting that she was very hardworking and was quiet. Another labelled her as bright and devoted to her studies. During university, she took on several work placements at hospitals in the Northwest, including Liverpool Women's Hospital and the Countess of Chester Hospital, and she eventually graduated in September 2011. Four months later, in January 2012, she was offered a position with the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Letby happily accepted the position. This is what she had been working towards for so many years. This is what she had dreamed about since she was a little girl. On the ward, she looked after sick and premature newborns. Her work ethic was so impressive that she soon qualified as a Band 5 nurse, and by the spring of 2014, she completed specialist training, which allowed her to work with infants who required intensive care. In 2013, in a staff profile, Lepre stated that she was responsible for caring for a wide range of babies requiring various levels of support, and that she enjoyed seeing them progress and supporting their families. She also reportedly participated in a campaign to raise funds for a new neonatal unit at the hospital. 
Later reflecting on her time as a nurse, let be told the courts, I enjoyed the intensive care work, that was my passion. All nurses on the unit have an area they prefer or excelled at, they knew I was happy. During her employment though, Letby was known to have labelled non-intensive care work boring and had been seen arguing with a senior colleague at least once when she was asked to work in the outside nursery where babies were treated in preparation for going home. The outside nursery took up two of the four rooms in the neonatal unit and Letby was described as being unhappy if she was given shifts in the outside nursery rather than in the intensive care or high dependency care rooms. Senior nurse Catherine Percival Calderbank later told jurors, she said it was boring and she didn't want to feed babies, she wanted to be in intensive care. Percival Calderbank added, however, that she preferred when her nurses took breaks from the stressful intensive or high dependency work, stating, it was more that we were worried for Lucy's mental health because it can be upsetting, emotional, and sometimes exhausting, as well at the end of a shift. If you are constantly put in that stressful situation all the time, Sometimes you've got to come out of that environment and be in an outside nursery. She also noted that Letby was keen to assist if an issue arose in the higher intensity rooms and would be there instantly if something happened. While across her academic career, Letby was often considered reserved, gentle and driven. Her peers at the hospital viewed her in a different light. Some described her as being eager to learn, to the point that she bordered on being a teacher's pet. Others though noted that she rubbed some people up the wrong way with her air of superiority. One unnamed nurse who worked with Letby told the Sunday Times, there were people who thought she was stuck up. I didn't think she was cold, but I could see why some people did. She liked things just so, and she stuck to the rules rigidly, or at least gave the impression that she did. She was always quick to point out the failings of others. She would always be the first person to tell you off if you had done something wrong. During her initial time in Chester, Letby lived in staff accommodation at Ash House. She later moved to a flat for about six months before returning to Ash House in the summer of 2015. The following year, she purchased a semi-detached home on Westbourne Street in Chester. A BBC report described her home as being ordinary. There was a drawing pinned to a notice board in the kitchen from her godson. It read, Number One Godmother Awarded to Lucy Letby. In her bedroom, she had Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore plush toys, while in the living room, there were veterinary documents for her two cats, Smudge and Tigger. Across her headboard, she'd entwined twinkling fairy lights and a duvet cover read Sweet Dreams. Her childlike decor tastes would later be seen as a stark contrast to the grave crimes she would be accused of committing. The Murders It was the summer of 2015 when a senior paediatrician and head consultant at Countess of Chester Hospital, Dr. Stephen Breary, noticed some unusual activity at the unit. Four fairly healthy babies had collapsed, a term used to describe infants who succumbed to sharp and catastrophic deterioration in health in a fortnight. Furthermore, their decline had come for no discernible reason. Only one of the four children had survived. Lucy's first known murder was of a one-day-old infant known as Child A. He had been delivered by C-section at 31 weeks and admitted to the intensive care room of the neonatal unit. Despite being premature, he was breathing without aid and was noted to overall be in good condition. On June 8, 2015, about an hour into her shift, Letby alerted doctors to the fact that the baby appeared to be collapsing. A doctor and consultant on the scene immediately noticed the odd discoloration of the infant's skin. It was described as having patches of pink over blue skin that appeared and disappeared. However, they were puzzled as to what this odd skin colouring was a symptom of. Later, it would emerge that Letby had injected air into child A's bloodstream through one of two tubes attached to his body. This would later become her go-to method of murder. Despite attempts to resuscitate the baby, he was pronounced dead at 8.58 p.m. While a nurse recalled seeing Letby standing over child A's incubator, she believed Letby was resuscitating the child and did not intervene until she realized the baby was not recovering under her care. The following day, on June 9th, 
Let B attempted to murder child B, who was child A's twin sister, using the same method as she had on child A. She watched as child B's health began to deteriorate. This time, however, the victim survived with no long-term consequences. Five days later, on June 14th, Let B murdered child C, a five-day-old baby, once again using her method of injecting air into one of the tubes attached to the infant. Another week passed. On June 21st, Let B murdered child D using an injection of air. Reports show that the baby collapsed three times and could not be saved. Concerned by the deaths, Dr. Breary began looking into the patient's case files, taking great care to examine the treatment they had undergone and who was on duty at the time. There was one person that each case had in common, Lucy Letby, who'd been present at each of the four collapses. At the time, Letby was 26 and known to be a perfectly ordinary woman. She went on nights out with her colleagues, went on holidays with her friends, took salsa classes, and was a godmother to two children. She lived with her two cats at her Westbourne Road property. Nobody suspected her of being involved. Rather, they thought it was unfortunate that she had experienced such a stressful event time and time again. A former friend described her as being like Miss Perfect, adding her parents used to think butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. She's literally the last person anyone would suspect as a killer. For Dr. Breary, the deaths were obviously suspicious but that alone wasn't enough for him to understand what had gone wrong. Premature babies in good health are not known to simply collapse and die. Unexplained deaths are extremely rare. Before these incidents, there had only been two to three deaths in the neonatal unit per year. It was also unusual that the babies had not responded to revival attempts as expected. Babies who got a heartbeat would usually have their breathing returned to normal but this was not the case with the children involved in these incidents. The results of Dr. Breary's review, along with information about the three suspicious deaths, were turned over to the Hospital Trust Committee for Serious Incidents, which is responsible for looking into matters of patient safety. However, the committee failed to share Dr. Breary's suspicions, classifying the incidents as medication errors, as opposed to a serious incident involving an unexpected death. If they had been classified as the latter, the incidents would have had to have been grouped together and an investigation would have been opened. Free to continue killing, Letby took another life in the early hours of August 4th when she injected air into the bloodstream of child E, a twin boy. The boy's mother was in the unit at the time, feeding the other twin when she heard a scream. She found child E with blood around his mouth in distress and Letby standing nearby. The mother later described the nurse as not doing anything, despite the emergency. Letby reportedly told her that the blood was the result of a nasogastric tube irritating the baby's throat and asked her to calm down. At the time of his death, child E had reportedly lost a quarter of his blood, with a specialist later telling courts that this was a striking amount of blood loss. Despite having a solid method of killing, Letby began experimenting with ways to take the lives of the babies under her care. The following day, she attempted to poison child F, child E's sibling, by using insulin, but he survived the attempt on his life. A month later in September, she twice tried to kill child G by feeding her too much milk. Though the infant survived, she was left severely disabled. It was later found that Letby had altered the baby's observation chart, writing that her temperature was higher than it actually was, to make it seem like she was already unwell before she was overfed milk. She also falsified details about the baby's collapse, reporting that it took place around the time that another nurse had fed her. On October 23rd, Letby took the life of child I by injecting air into her stomach via a nasogastric tube. The baby collapsed four times before dying. Chillingly, newspapers reported that Letby later sent a sympathy card to the child's parents after taking a photograph of the card, which she kept on her phone. She also looked up their social media accounts and expressed a desire to go to the baby's funeral. Child I's mother would later state that Letby behaved oddly as she bathed the newborn with her mother sometime before death, stating, while we were bathing her, Lucy came back in. She was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at the first bath and how our daughter had loved it. I wish that she would just stop talking. On the same day of Child I's murder, 
a nurse and ward manager named Irian Powell began reviewing the cases. Like Stephen Beery, she was concerned about the number of incidents and she eventually came to the same conclusion he did, that the only thing the deaths of the babies had in common was that Lucy was on shift. She subsequently contacted Dr. Breary to let him know of her findings, writing, unfortunate that Lucy was on, however each case of death is different. By this time, word of the numerous infant deaths had spread across the hospital, and the facility's medical director became aware of the strange goings on at the neonatal unit. At the time, however, he believed that their death rate was still lesser than or similar to other hospitals of their size. Therefore, he was not immediately alarmed. Though Irian Powell and Stephen Breary attempted to raise their concerns, their issues were reportedly either resisted by the committee for serious incidents or ignored. Alarmed doctors and nurses were reportedly told to not make a fuss. In February 2016, Dr. Breary, along with a specialist consultant from Liverpool, carried out a half-day thematic review into the collapses in the neonatal unit. This produced a report which showed that Letby was on shift for each of the incidents, all of which took place between 12 and 4 a.m. Breary subsequently emailed the hospital medical director with the report attached and requested an immediate meeting, but nothing further came of it. Hospital management believed that Letby's involvement was a coincidence and she continued to work in the neonatal unit. Two months later, on April 7th, Letby was moved to day shifts. She was told that it was for the benefit of her mental health, with Powell noting that she had been present for each collapse. Two days later, she attempted to take the lives of two children, twin baby boys known as Child Al and Child M. She injected Child M with air and used insulin to try and poison Child Al. Both infants survived the ordeal. Powell, meanwhile, remained concerned about Letby's involvement and continuously emailed others for help including the hospital's director of nursing, Alison Kelly. It was eventually agreed with the hospital's medical director that they would review all deaths and have Letby remain on day shift for three months. Doctors at the hospital who were aware of the situation told Powell, you are harboring a murderer. In June, Letby attempted to murder child N, a 34-week-old baby, but the infant survived. Later that month, she travelled out of the country for a week-long stay in Ibiza. Shortly before her return to work, on June 23rd, she texted a friend with the eerie message, probably be back in with a bang, lol. Within hours after she'd started back at work, she took the lives of two triplets, known as Child O and P. Child O was described as being a perfectly healthy baby and was due to be discharged, but he suddenly collapsed on the 23rd. He collapsed a further three times before passing away. A post-mortem later showed that his body contained an unusual amount of gas and his liver had been damaged. This liver damage was reportedly the result of an impact injury, similar to the type of injury sustained after a car crash. Less than 15 minutes following Child O's death, Child P, who was also due to be discharged, collapsed after his diaphragm was shattered. He was expected to make a full recovery but as doctors readied him to be moved to another hospital, Letby reportedly said, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Newspaper reports note that she made a similar statement before Child C died. She also texted a doctor, claiming she would be watching them both, Child P and the third sibling, like a hawk. Child P died shortly after this point, with x-rays revealing that he had a bizarre amount of gas in his body, like his brother, the third triplet was moved to another hospital with the medics who had come to take child P. A consultant recalled allowing this because the parents had begged for it, afraid that they would lose their last remaining child. Further investigation. Following the deaths of children O and P, Stephen Breary demanded that Letby be removed from the neonatal unit the duty executive he spoke with, however, argued that the 26-year-old was fit for work, not a safety risk, and added that she was happy to take responsibility should any more issues arise while she was caring for the babies. Towards the end of the month, the hospital trust's executive director met up to discuss the deaths of the children and whether or not law enforcement should be informed. By this point, 
seven babies had died in the neonatal unit. The executive seemed to believe that signs of Letby's involvement were circumstantial and suspected that certain doctors were participating in an ill-informed witch hunt. They eventually decided not to involve the authorities and instead organized a review through the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, or the RCPCH, which began in September of that year. Additionally, it was agreed that the hospital's neonatal unit would no longer welcome premature births younger than 32 weeks. Infants under this age were cared for instead by other hospitals. In mid-July, Lepi was moved into an administrative role after a meeting with a senior nurse and HR manager, where she was made aware of the link between her and the deceased. She was also told that she would be put under supervision and was reported to have been visibly upset and distressed. However, staff shortages meant that Lepi could not be supervised in the neonatal ward, hence why she was moved into an admin role. She never returned to the neonatal ward. In September, she raised a formal grievance against the Trust for Victimization and Discrimination, claiming that she had been singled out, moved from a job she'd loved, and that the allegations against her were unclear. She demanded to know what claims were being investigated. Several months later, in October 2016, the RCPCH concluded its investigations and reported its findings. Their review did not investigate Letby's actions or the deaths of the children and focused on the neonatal unit's conduct. The RCPCH was unable to find a concrete explanation for the increase in deaths, but noted that there were major staffing issues in the unit and that there was not enough senior staff available. It also recommended that each baby's death be reviewed in detail and noted that not all of the babies had been sent for post-mortems despite this being the best course of action in the aftermath of their deaths. Jane Horden, a neonatologist from Great Ormond Street Hospital, was asked to review the cases, but she was unable to do so in detail. Instead, she agreed to provide a summary after reviewing the case notes. She recommended that a forensic review of the cases be carried out, but this never came to fruition. Ten hospital staff were interviewed, in connection with Lebby's complaint, while most of them threatened to call the police if she was returned to the neonatal unit, there were a few people who came to her defense. A senior nurse claimed that the doctors were participating in a witch hunt, stating, I hope she returns to the unit. We would be delighted. Investigators looking into the complaint also combed through Letby's work history. They found nothing to indicate that her conduct was bad or unprofessional. No complaints had ever been filed against her. Eventually, investigators concluded that the doctors were at fault for being suspicious of her. They told her, This behavior has resulted in you, a junior colleague and fellow professional, feeling isolated and vulnerable, putting your reputation in question. This is unacceptable and could be viewed as victimization. The report also stated that the hospital would aid her professional career by supporting her with a master's degree or an advanced neonatal course. She was also offered weekly welfare check-ins with a senior nurse. The investigation was ended on November 12th. Notably, no further deaths in the neonatal ward had occurred in the four months since Letby had been removed. In March 2017, consultants have been spoken with and received advice from a regional neonatal lead who believed further investigation into the cases was required, asked management to involve the police. On April 27th, they met with Cheshire Constabulary, noting that Lucy Letby was due to return to the neonatal ward on May 3rd. This examination of the unexplained deaths was named Operation Hummingbird, and it aimed to investigate the cases of deaths and collapse of premature babies in the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal ward. At its height, Operation Hummingbird involved almost 70 officers and civilian staff, and just over a year later, on July 3rd, 2018, those same people saw the fruits of their labor when Lucy Letby was arrested on suspicion of eight counts of murder and six counts of attempted murder. The Trial Over the next few years, Letby would be bailed and subsequently rearrested several times, with the final time being on November 10th, 2020. The following day, she was charged with eight counts of murder and 10 counts of attempted murder and was denied bail. For her part, 
let be denied all the charges against her, claiming that many of the deaths were a result of poor hygiene and insufficient staffing levels at the hospital. The Nursing and Midwifery Council, who'd suspended Letby in March 2020, began seeking to have her struck off the register. Letby's trial began at Manchester Crown Court on October 10th, 2022. She pleaded not guilty to seven counts of murder and 15 counts of attempted murder. There was much secrecy surrounding the identities of Letby's victims and their families, who testified at the trial. With Helen Pidd writing for The Guardian, that such secrecy was rarely seen outside proceedings involving matters of national security. Some of Letby's colleagues were also protected at trial, including a doctor who was said to be her boyfriend. No one was aware that Letby had a boyfriend, but the prosecution claimed that she had been romantically entangled with a married registrar at the hospital, a man who is still unidentified today. For her part, Letby claimed there was no affair and that the two were just friends. However, handwritten notes recovered from her house, which police searched after she was first arrested in 2018, showed that she loved the man. The jury was later shown text message exchanges between the two, which showed Letby sending him love hearts. They were also informed that the pair spent a lot of time together. They took trips to London, went out for meals, and spent time in Letby's semi-detached Chester home. Like she'd done with the families of her victims, she'd even searched for the man's wife on social media, the duo's connection didn't go unnoticed by colleagues. One nurse stated that while she wasn't sure if anything physical was going on, they were unusually close for work colleagues. She added, I know there was gossip and comments about this on the ward, which she didn't like. Their partnership apparently fizzled out, however, in the summer of 2016, when Letby was moved to an administrative role and the doctor left to work elsewhere. She reportedly felt isolated having been moved away from her colleagues and friends on the neonatal ward, and was subsequently prescribed medication for insomnia and depression. Some reports stated that the doctor had driven Letby home the night that one of her victims had died, and the prosecution suggested at one point that her actions had been motivated by her desire for him to notice her. The prosecution labelled Letby a malevolent presence and described her as cold, calculating, cruel and relentless. Much of the evidence heard at the trial includes several pieces of information we've already covered in this video, including x-rays and post-mortems and falsified patient records, that Letby was seen standing over the babies on several occasions by colleagues and by concerned parents, that she was on shift at the time of the deaths, and that the murders stopped after she was moved off the ward. But there were also other pieces of evidence. Several items of note were recovered from Letby's home by police, one such item was a record of the drugs provided to child M during resuscitation efforts. Another was a paper towel and a blood gas reading document also for child M. 257 hospital documents, which should not have left the premises, were also found. 21 of these sheets pertained to babies she was believed to have harmed. Some of the most interesting pieces of evidence entered into the trial were scribblings Let B had made on post-it notes. They included phrases such as, I don't deserve to live. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them. I am a horrible, evil person. I don't want to do this anymore. And I am evil, I did this. It was said that in other notes, she wrote about her frustrations at not being allowed back on the neonatal ward. I haven't done anything wrong and they have no evidence. So why have I had to hide away? Another scribbled post-it read, I'll never marry or have children. I'll never know what it's like to have a family. Letby's defense claimed that these notes were the anguished outpouring of a woman in fear and despair. While Letby herself claimed, I felt at the time that if I'd done something wrong, I must be such an evil, awful person. I'd somehow been incompetent and had done something wrong which had affected those babies. I felt I must be responsible in some way. I think looking back at it now, I was really struggling, and this was a way of me expressing what I wasn't able to say to anyone else. Furthermore, investigators recovered Letby's diary from her home, where it was found that the initials of her victims were written down on the days they were killed. When asked about the hospital paperwork she'd brought home and the social media searches she'd made looking for the victims' families, she said on both occasions, that was a normal pattern of behavior for me and offered very little explanation, sounding robotic sometimes in her responses. Reporters noted that she had started out sounding well-spoken and unflustered and described her as cooperative, but that eventually she began to break down, most notably when she began to discuss herself and the impact the case had on her. 
Judith Moritz wrote for the BBC, It wasn't until February that I saw a hint of emotion from Lepi. It was the voice of a doctor that caused the nurse to break. His voice seemed to trigger feelings we hadn't seen before. Moritz noted that it was the unidentified boyfriend of Lepi who provoked feelings from her for the first time during the trial. When asked about why she cried when discussing herself, but not the babies or their families, she simply said, I have cried when talking about some of those babies. Letby also reportedly asked to stop for the first time during the trial, when the prosecution began interrogating her, picking holes in her testimony and pointing out conflicting information she had given. Judith wrote that the prosecution asked, You're lying, aren't you, Lucy Letby? You enjoyed what was going on, didn't you? Afterwards, Letby became monosyllabic before she asked to stop. On August 18th, 2023, Letby was found guilty of seven counts of murder, and seven counts of attempted murder. The verdict of six counts of attempted murder could not be agreed upon by the jury, and she was acquitted of two further counts of attempted murder. Lepi was sentenced three days later to life in prison with a whole life order, the most severe sentence possible under English law. The judge described her as having no remorse, stating that she carried out a cruel, calculated and cynical campaign of child murder involving the smallest and most vulnerable of children. Since she opted not to attend the sentencing hearing, she did not hear the numerous victim impact statements which were read out. Other Motives The prosecution alleged that Let Be may have been motivated to kill by the need for attention, mostly from a certain doctor, but this isn't the only motive supplied. They also suggested that she killed out of boredom, that she got a thrill from emergencies, and that she enjoyed playing God and being in control. They were not, however, the only ones to think that Letby might have killed for attention. One nurse who spoke at the trial later told the Sunday Times that she believed she longed for the drama that the deaths brought, stating hurting babies was a win-win situation for her. If they didn't die, she'd get the praise of being the person who helped resuscitate them. If they died, she'd get the sympathy for being the one whose baby died while trying to save them. Criminologist David Wilson agreed that Letby appeared to have a hero complex and added that killers who become healthcare workers have already developed a desire to kill before they join the healthcare setting. Both The Guardian and The Telegraph concluded separate motives based on the handwritten post-it notes collected by investigators. The former suggested that the line, I killed them on purpose because I am not good enough to care for them, was a motive, while the latter believed her fear of never marrying or having children pushed her to destruction. There has also been some suggestion that she suffered from FDIA, a factitious disorder imposed on another, formerly known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a mental health disorder where a caregiver creates the appearance of health problems in another. This idea was suggested by a former detective who worked on the Beverly Allett case in the 1990s. Allett is an English serial killer convicted of the murder of four children, the attempted murder of three more, and causing GBH to a further six when she worked at a children's ward as a nurse. Her motive for murder has never been identified, but FDIA has been suggested over the years. Criminal psychologist David Holmes and Dominic Wilmot have expressed their support for this theory in regards to both killers, with Wilmot stating, she wants to be involved in this case. She actually has the perfect opportunity not to be right. So we expect most offenders to not want to get caught and to distance themselves from their offending behavior. Beverly Allett and Lucy Letby seem to be injecting themselves into the inquiry, into the circumstances, so it shows that there's something else going on here. The Aftermath Letby is currently incarcerated in Bronzefield Prison in Ashford, Surrey. On September 15th, 2023, just weeks following her conviction, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division confirmed that she had applied for permission to appeal against her convictions. Meanwhile, the CPS confirmed that same month that there would be a retrial of one of the six counts of attempted murder that the jury could not agree on. A date of June 10th, 2024 had been set. Investigations are currently ongoing as to whether or not there are any further crimes that Letby is responsible for. So far, one family whose child was born at Liverpool Women's Hospital, where Letby carried out some of her placement while studying nursing, have been contacted and told that they are part of the inquiry. 
Around 30 other incidents at Countess of Chester Hospital involving infants have been labelled as suspicious and will be thoroughly examined by law enforcement. Letby was officially removed from the nursing register in December 2023 and her conviction has led the UK government to order an independent inquiry into the circumstances of the case. The investigation would look into the circumstances surrounding the deaths and incidents, including how concerns raised by clinicians were dealt with. In August 2018, the hospital's medical director, Ian Harvey, retired to France, and a month later, the chief executive, Tony Chambers, resigned after signing a non-disclosure agreement with the trust but gained employment elsewhere in the NHS. Director of Nursing Alison Kelly was suspended from her new job with another hospital trust, while Karen Reese, the head of nursing at the time, retired quietly, noting that she was not given enough information by doctors to remove Letby from her position. The inquiry was formally opened on November 22, 2023. Parents of the children Letby attacked and killed made their voices known when they read out their victim impact statements in court. The parents of child A and B noted that let B was nothing to them, while the mother of child D said, I cannot forgive you. There is no forgiving, not now, not ever. I had a car crash after a mental breakdown. I considered ending it all. I couldn't continue and I didn't want to. Meanwhile, the mother of child E and F stated, our world was shattered when we encountered evil disguised as a caring nurse. Even in these final days of the trial, she has tried to control things. The disrespect she has shown the families in the court show what type of person she is. We have attended court day in and day out, yet she decides she has had enough and stays in her cell. Just one final act of wickedness from a coward. Letby's parents were there every day of her trial, along with one remaining friend. Many people who knew her struggled to make the connection between the reserved and kind woman they knew and the serial killer she turned out to be. She is now considered the most prolific serial killer of children in modern British history, and her name will be remembered alongside the likes of Myra Hindley, Mary Ann Cotton, and Rosemary West.